The honoring and deification of rulers was a common occurrence throughout history. From the pharaohs of ancient Egypt to the emperors of dynastic China, a plethora of leaders used their connection to gods and other divine beings as a tool to gain legitimacy, increase their power, or even just enhance their own reputation. The ancient Romans too deified their rulers as well, in the form of the imperial cult, but they had a unique approach towards the concept compared to other empires that preceded and followed them. What made the Roman approach to the ruler cult so unique was the very thing that made the Roman religion so unique, that it was tied to the Roman state itself and was a secular institution as much as a spiritual one. Welcome to our video on the imperial cult of ancient Rome and how the Romans made turning their emperors into gods a core pillar of their national statecraft. When it came to getting a sponsor for this video, we couldn't find anyone offering to turn you into a god, but we have someone who'll turn you into a lord or a lady. That's the service of established titles. They sell small plots of land in Scotland, which are sought after because of a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies in English. But to protect these lands, a tree is planted with every order, and established titles supports charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. So it's a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. You'll get at least one square foot of land in Scotland with a unique plot number and a certificate to prove it. This allows you to officially get Lord or Lady on your credit cards, plane tickets and more. You can also get maps to show your new estate, including the immensely detailed hand-drawn 1611 map by John Speed, held by the National Library of Scotland. It makes a great last-minute gift, and they even have couple packs that come with adjoining plots of land. The first 200 plots bought via our link will all be put together within a few minutes of each other next to the Kings and Generals plot, so act fast to join our little union of forest territories. Check out their Black Friday sale for discounts. Plus, if you use our code KINGS, you'll get an extra 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash kings to get yourself a title or give it as a gift and help support the channel. With the Roman Republic undergoing seemingly endless territorial and economic expansion in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, it also entered a state of perpetual civil unrest and political instability. The intrinsic system of the Republic was designed so that no man or faction would become too powerful. However, as Rome's power and territory grew, so too did the power of certain outstanding individuals. This disparity between theory and practice in Roman society only grew wider after the military reforms of Gaius Marius, which effectively ensured that Roman generals could command a great deal of power. Ironically, it was Marius's bitter rival, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, that made great use of this situation. Sulla's victory over Marius in the first great civil war in the Republic's history positioned him as the first man of Rome. However, in spite of the fact that he used his newfound dictatorial powers to change laws and purge his enemies, he left the political institutions of the Roman Republic fundamentally unchanged. Significant changes to the system may not have been done, yet the Republic's facade of stability was permanently crippled. Indeed, it took not even three decades for Rome to descend into chaos again. Much like his predecessor Sulla, Julius Caesar fought a civil war and became the head of the Roman state. Be that as it may, this is where the similarities between the two end. Unlike Sulla, Caesar had much greater ambitions, and retiring to live a quiet life in the country was not one of them. Whereas Sulla only went as far as to be called favoured by Venus, Caesar had portrayed himself as a descendant both of the goddess of love Venus and of Rome's founder, Romulus. In doing so, Caesar created a cult of worship around himself, which would become the foundation of the deification of later Roman emperors. According to Itai Gradal, there were three phases in the creation of Caesar's cult. After his victory at the Battle of Thapsus in 46 BC, the Senate decreed that a statue of him would be placed on the Capitol with an inscription stating that he was a demigod. Caesar's victory at Munda was followed by the placement of a statue of him in the Temple of Carinus, with the inscription reading that he was an unconquered god. In the final stage of Caesar's cult, he was equated with Rome's official gods, 
with his cult being given an official name, Divus Julius, as well as a priest and temple. The last phase did not materialize, as Caesar was assassinated on the Ides of March before his flamen, Mark Antony, was inaugurated as priest. Octavian, though quite young at the time of Caesar's death, was wise enough not to follow in some of his stepfather's footsteps. Believing that Caesar's incessant honoring of his own person was the cause of his undoing, he steered clear of self-aggrandizement after his rise to power. Octavian was planning to rule Rome for slightly more than a few years, and approached the matter of his spiritual legitimacy carefully and patiently. In 29 BC, he dedicated a temple to Divus Julius at the site of Caesar's cremation, thereby cementing his position as Divi Filius, the son of a god. While Octavian would not refer to himself as a god openly during his entire reign, he did little to hinder others from considering him as such. It was this fine line that Octavian walked in politics as well, never positioning himself as a dictator or a pseudo-monarch, but as a princeps, a primus inter pares. Agrippa intended to dedicate a new temple on the Campus Martius to the first princeps, with his cult image inside it. Augustus prohibited Agrippa from carrying out this plan, and the temple, later known as the Pantheon, was dedicated to other purposes. Two words which perfectly describe the Roman religion after Octavian's ascension to power are tradition and innovation. Following nearly a century of strife in Rome, Octavian had brought long-desired peace. Since the Roman state and religion were inherently linked, this was not just an earthly peace, but the peace of the gods. All of the temples, shrines and buildings which Octavian had rebuilt were not dedicated to himself. Instead, he chose a rather subtle approach by ensuring that the people of Rome knew while the buildings themselves weren't made in his honor, the initiative to rebuild them had been his. Moreover, these buildings were formally dedicated on dates that were important to him, such as birthdays and anniversaries of important victories. Meanwhile, Octavian also expertly maneuvered through Caesar's controversial connection with Romulus and the Roman kingdom. He restored and reformed the old priesthood, which boasted about its mythical connection with the founder of the Eternal City, who was considered a divisive figure during the late Republic since Romulus had been a king and the Romans of the Republic hated kings. Although Octavian would have loved nothing more than to associate himself with Romulus, he decided against it due to the fact that a monarchy stood in stark contrast with everything that the Republic, and therefore he, officially stood for. In the end, Octavian's advisors discovered that he could be partially a god and a king, yet neither at the same time. As Octavian had restored the peace of the gods through August Augury, a divine technique that Romulus used when founding the city, he was given the honorific epithet Augustus, an adjective with substantial religious notes, yet also unburdened by any direct allusions to kingship. Once Lepidus had died in 12 BC, Augustus formally became Pontifex Maximus, a title that would become hereditary after his death. He restored Rome's old priesthoods, and also reorganized Rome's neighborhoods, or Vici, in such a way that the majority of the community leaders, or Vico Magistri, were freedmen and other commoners. This made him extremely popular with Rome's lower classes, and had a great influence on the imperial cult, becoming a household and community cult. In Rome, Augustus respected the sentiments of the Senate, and accepted a compromise that did not allow him to directly establish a cult for himself. The situation was completely different outside of the city. Numerous local cults that treated Augustus akin to a god are believed to have been unofficially sponsored by the state. However, in state religion, Augustus was not officially deified preceding his death. In fact, when writing about his death, Tacitus makes no mention of Augustus as a god, devoting only a minor remark about his burial. Once it had been completed according to custom, a temple and rituals typical for celestial beings were decreed. These local cults were enthusiastically accepted in the rest of Italy, over time becoming household cults. One example of this is Forum Claudii in northern Italy, where inscriptions related to the cult make it clear that they equated the worship of Augustus's divinity to the worship of Augustus the god. Outside Italy, the situation differed in each province and municipality. 
For the most part, outside of Rome, Augustus was directly worshipped as a deity, especially in the Greek provinces, where the imperial cult was viewed as a continuation of the cults of Hellenistic rulers of Alexander's Diadochi. Although people generally did not directly equate him to the existing pantheon of Roman gods, Augustus was given godlike honours. When Augustus shared a temple with other deities, the Greeks were careful not to represent him as the god's equal. In peripheral provinces, such as Gallia Lugdunensis and Germania Inferior, the imperial cult did not begin thriving until decades after it did in Italy, Spain or Asia Minor. However, due to the strong military presence in those regions, military commanders in those provinces would occasionally establish shrines to Augustus, which slowly introduced the people of those areas to the imperial cult. Before we continue, it's worth mentioning that emperor worship had nothing to do with personal deities that could guide people to salvation. The Roman religion was not a religion of salvation, and the rituals of the religion were regarded with much higher importance than the dogma. That being said, it is possible that certain people viewed Augustus as a deity who brought salvation from many decades of war and instability. The imperial cult was also not exclusive to the Greco-Roman religion, as worshippers of various other pantheons in the empire also honoured the emperors, often more than the Romans themselves. One of Augustus's greatest legacies was that he left the Roman state in a more unified condition than that in which he had found it, and scholars believe that his cult was one of the driving forces behind it. Augustus was posthumously deified, which did not change much for Rome's religious landscape, owing to the fact that Tiberius rigidly kept the system that his predecessor had established. He not only refused to be deified while still alive, but also refused many of Augustus's godlike honours. Caligula's accession was far more complicated, as he was chosen as a co-heir with Tiberius's grandson, Tiberius Gemellus. Due to the fact that Gemellus was still a child, the Senate had rendered Tiberius's will invalid. Under these circumstances, Caligula could no longer claim the principate by the auctoritas inherited from Tiberius. Therefore, the Senate had to invest him with imperial powers by decree. This was, in essence, the first formal admission of the Roman state that it was, for the first time in over 500 years, once again a monarchy. Later in the same year, the Senate had ordered that sacrifices should take place to honour the new emperor. Caligula, uncharacteristically, refused this honour, as well as an offer to have a state temple dedicated to himself. However, later into his reign, his good relationship with the Senate, as well as his moderatio, began deteriorating heavily, and he began to humiliate the very institution that had granted him this power. There is no doubt about the fact that Caligula endlessly emphasised his limitless power. What is a matter of scholarly debate, however, is whether he claimed to be a god or was simply an eccentric. For example, the writer Filio views Caligula's tendency to dress up like certain gods in public as an act of blasphemy, while Dio and Suetonius view it as the comportment of a lunatic. Archaeological findings show absolutely no evidence of Caligula ever being deified by the Roman state, which is in contrast with the modern view of him as a megalomaniac. Nevertheless, most future emperors steered clear of any dalliances with the divine, if not for any other reason than because of the obvious links between death and divinity. Many parallels can be drawn between Caligula, Domitian and Commodus referring to themselves as Dominus et Deus and Romanus Hercules, respectively, they drew the ire of many of their contemporaries, along with modern scholars, though there is no clear proof that either of them had used those titles and honours outside of private settings and in an official capacity. The rule of another eccentric emperor, Nero, represented a great challenge for the imperial cult, not just because of his damnatio memoriae, but also for the reason that his death meant that the Julio-Claudian dynasty was no more. The new emperor, Vespasian, could in no way claim descent from the ancient kings of Rome, gods, or even the previous imperial family. To compensate for this, the Senate immediately started drawing similarities between Vespasian and Augustus, such as how both of them restored peace to Rome, how both were victorious in a civil war, and how both of their lives were marked by a myriad of good omens and oracles. On one hand, 
Vespasian publicly made great effort to further this cause. While on the other, he was known to boast about his obscure origins in private. Ironically, several Jewish scholars, such as Josephus, considered Vespasian to be a messianic figure of Judaism, due to the fact that he was the man from Judea who ruled the world. Vespasian approached his death and future deification with a sense of humor, with Suetonius remarking that his last words were, I think I am becoming a god. As we have previously mentioned, the imperial cult quickly became a household cult. Unfortunately, owing to insufficient evidence, we know very few details about how it functioned in the average citizen's domestic life. Wall paintings and mosaics that were found in private houses from archaeological sites in cities like Ostia or Pompeii scarcely ever contain any reference to the emperors. Certain scholars do not consider this lack of evidence as a confirmation of the absence of a household imperial cult. This merely suggests that the imperial cult was focused on living rulers rather than deceased ones. Proof of this can be found in a letter from Fronto to his pupil Marcus Aurelius, which mentions that his likeness can be found in many private houses and businesses, though painted badly. The little archaeological evidence that exists is mostly represented by small sculptures of emperors and members of the imperial family. In one peculiar case, however, a life-size silver bust of Galba was found at Herculaneum, which was presumably left behind after the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD. The fact that the imperial cult had been disseminated so quickly throughout the empire begs the question, how did it spread so far and so quickly? This is an especially interesting question, considering the fact that the vast majority of emperors rarely left Rome and Italy, so only a handful of citizens had the opportunity to meet or see them. In these circumstances, the fabricated image of the emperor was used as a substitute for his presence. Coins were minted, statues were raised, and pictures were painted with their likeness, and for followers of the imperial cult, the conviction that a statue of the emperor was just as powerful as the emperor himself was more than just a primitive belief. From the late 2nd century AD, inscriptions started appearing where it is said that an individual or a group of people dedicated themselves to the emperor's divine power and his majesty. The priests of the imperial cult were no less ordinary than the flamen of any other Roman god. Their dress reflected the latest Roman fashion, and they would have many of the same duties as their colleagues that tended to other cults. A notable exception to this is the priests of the imperial cult in the eastern provinces, who were usually extravagantly dressed and wore a golden crown with the image of Caesar on it. The rituals likewise followed the Roman model. When Augustus was first consecrated, his birthday, along with the birthdays of Tiberius and his wife Livia, were marked by the sacrifice of an ox to Jupiter. Similarly, during the reign of Nero, the emperor's birthday was celebrated with sacrifices to the Capitoline Triad, the emperor's genius, Concordia and Salus Publica, which translates to public welfare. Rome's transformation into an empire may have saved it from a premature collapse and unified the different peoples of Rome behind its rulers. This was greatly aided by the imperial cult, which was accepted by people of many faiths and although it caused certain problems over the centuries, it also proved to be a bastion of stability that Rome oftentimes desperately needed. The Roman imperial cult proved to be both resilient and malleable, surviving many a bad emperor, the year of the four emperors, the crisis of the third century, and other tumultuous events. Nevertheless, it did not survive its confrontation with a religion almost as old as the cult itself, Christianity. Thanks again to our sponsor, Established Titles. Buy a small plot of land in Scotland and become a lady or a lord, or give this title as an amazing and easy gift. In return, Established Titles plants a tree to protect the pristine forests of our planet. Take advantage of their Black Friday sale and use our discount code KINGS at establishedtitles.com kings to get a further 10% off. In our next video on the evolution of Roman religion, we'll explore the rise of the faith of the carpenter from Galilee, so make sure to subscribe and press the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps us immensely. Our videos would be impossible to produce without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links down in the description, 
To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.